Hi, I'm Meredith Blackwell. This Don, is Don Feaster. Feaster. And Peter Kennedy, and we'll get back to him. But I want to say that we are at the University of Florida campus, uh, the Campus Hotel Hilton, and we're here for the Mycological Society of America meeting, and it is the 11th of July, 2022. Great. And this is part of the oral history project for mycology, and we're going to interview Peter now. We always begin these, Peter, by having people tell us a little bit about themselves, where they grew up, background, and ultimately, of course, we want to know how you got into uh, mycology and fungi. Sure. So. Okay. Well, first of all, I just want to say thank you. This is really uh, an honor and an opportunity, and I also want to say thank you for what both of you have done for the society and uh, for keeping our history rich and alive, and uh, this is a special special thing for me. So, um, thank you. yeah, in terms of how I, I guess my path, is that where we're starting? Yeah, so path. I, okay. You start with being born. I was born, <laughs> I was born in 1977. Um, and I am from, uh, Washington state. Uh, I grew up on a Island near Seattle, Washington called Bainbridge Island. Uh, I spent a lot of my time, uh, I think is probably some of us did uh, playing in the woods and getting to explore those beautiful and diverse green forests. Um, I did not see myself as a scientist growing up at all. I was, uh, I guess, more interested in, thought about, you know, sports for a long time. And then I thought about, um, did get excited about the idea of teaching at one point, but uh, ultimately I ended up as an undergraduate at um, the Evergreen State College, which is in Olympia, Washington. It's a different school, it's a public institution, but there are no grades and the courses are team taught. And so it was a bit of a, a non-traditional setting. Um, and I took a range of different courses. I actually thought I was gonna go into sort of civil rights and sort of social justice work as a incoming student, but I had taken biology as a uh, high school student, AP biology, and really liked it. And so I took one last uh, biology course before I was heading off in this other trajectory. Um, and it was an ecology course that really uh, completely inspired me to sort of stay in science. And so when I was um, a junior, I got to take a year's worth of courses on um, rainforests and their ecology, both in the temperate and tropical zones. And so I got to do some work and eventually ended up in the Peruvian Amazon and realized that I thought science was something I would like to do long term. So I hustled back up to the University of Washington thinking I need to go to graduate school. Didn't have any transcripts at the time, or my grades, it was, it was all these transcripts which were very big, and so I thought I should probably get a few grades to show that Evergreen's <laughs> not this crazy right. place. And I ended up actually taking a mycology course uh, at the University of Washington that was, um, Joe Emirati taught a summer course. Uh, he was out that summer, so it was taught by Michelle Seidel, and then the TA for that course was Brandon Matheny, who was just starting his PhD, and so it was a small and fun connection there, but I, I loved mycology, I loved the course, it was great, the collecting was excellent, um, but I didn't really know that that was gonna be my long-term path, and it wasn't until I graduated and I got to do some work in Panama as a uh, undergraduate technician working in the mangrove swamps, and it was one trip up to the cloud forest on a break from the hot and humid uh, mangrove swamps that we were in um, a cloud cloud forest reserve, and a lot of the mushrooms that um, I had seen as a kid, my dad was a, he was a mycoforager. Uh, the one and only time I've gotten sick eating mushrooms was when my dad told me that I should try out these mushrooms, which were <laughs> yellow staining. <laughs> Agaric said I should not have tried, but anyways, um, yeah, I saw these fungi, I thought, wow, this is really, you know, basically the same set that I remember growing up with in, you know, the rainforest in, in, in around Seattle, and, uh, and so I started reading more at the time, and I knew a little bit about the mycorrhizal symbiosis, but I didn't know a lot about it. And uh, that really inspired me to think about, you know, the below ground part of these forests and that diversity and how that might actually explain a lot of what we see above ground. And so ultimately I ended up at um, UC Berkeley. And so I ended up at UC Berkeley and um, I knew that I was interested broadly in the topic of ecology, but I knew that I really wanted to study fungi. At the time, I wasn't really sure which group of fungi I was going to think about. And so I got down there and I had made a connection with the person who I'd worked with in the mangroves who was an ecologist. And they still had phones back then that had, you know, cords on them. And they actually had a phone book that was all the faculty. And so I called up um, Tom Bruns. And Tom 
answered the phone um, on the second ring and I said, hey, and I introduced myself, complete cold call. And he said, come on over, I've got a few minutes before some class that he was going off to oh, teach. Oh, you were there in Berkeley. I was in Berkeley visiting and trying to think, could I make this work um, as a place where I could you know, both study mycology and, and also ecology. And so I walked over and, uh, and he told me, well, you know, we've got these tools now that allow us to say a lot about where fungi are in the environment that we don't necessarily always have to rely on the, the presence of mushrooms. And um, there's some exciting ecological sort of frontiers that we can use these techniques to pursue. And so that really felt like a kind of unique and, and uh, serendipitous opportunity. And so I, I went to UC Berkeley and I was co-mentored by Tom Browns and my uh, ecological advisor, a guy named Wayne Souza. And gosh, I stayed on. So I got a, uh, I, I graduated um, in their labs. I was doing research at that point, thinking about fungi and their role in forest encroachment into habitats um, in California. And um, Tom had done all this work up at Point Reyes. There was this huge fire that he claims he didn't set, although there's still controversies about that. Um, but anyways, uh, he had this great study system. And what I liked about it so much was that at the time, you know, for ecologists, um, there's sort of this relationship between pattern and process, right? So you look at these landscapes, you figure out what these patterns are, and you're fascinated by the processes that drive them. And, and he had done a ton of work in that system to establish the patterns of which species were where, these fungal species were where, and mycorrhizal species in particular. And so there was these great contrasts between these sets of taxa that were closely related. So we did a lot of work on the genus Rhizopogon. And it set this foundation to say, how do these species interact? Which is what I spent a lot of time working on in my postdoc um, with Tom. And so um, I worked for a couple of years out at Point Reyes National Seashore as a postdoc. Um, from there, gosh, I guess it was, it was in grad school. My first MSA was in, I think it was in 2002. It was in Corvallis. And That's was, a good one. Yep, it was a fantastic meeting. I remember meeting lots of folks there. And at that time, it wasn't so common to go to both MSA and ESA. And there was a handful of folks that would do it. And we were sort of, I would say, um, you know, a limited number. I think that that sort of um, convergence has grown in the time that I let, let me ask you about something. Was Beeson part of the funding at the time? You know, that came on in the time of my postdoc. And so that wasn't something that was there right. Do you want to mention what that was? Sure. Um, yeah. So that was the, uh, boy, Fungal Ecological Sampling <laughs> Informatics Network, maybe. <laughs> boy, that's pretty yeah. good. Um, <laughs> Tom would go off to Europe and have these meetings uh, where he was meeting with folks. Um, and I think he was really trying to help us all converge on a way to kind of talk the same language in terms of coming up with barcoding regions and establishing techniques and methods that would allow us to make inferences across systems. Um, yeah, and I, this was an NSF-funded project, and I think it was the thing after the deep hypo, which was systematics, exactly right. that came on to emphasize ecology. That is exactly right. That is exactly yeah. right. Yep. And so we were lucky in that, I mean, I felt like I... I came in at a time again where there was enough knowledge. There was, you know, at this point, you know, thousands of fungal environmental sequences that were out in these databases. Whereas, you know, even five years before that, there was, there was just hundreds. And, and you know, you mentioned Tom and his tools, mm. and I, I've been reading a lot about underground networks mm. these days that are very popular, and especially some in the popular literature. Sure. But I don't see Tom's name mentioned. And, you know, I, I just want to mention it now because I, I think he's uh, just kind of not, not ignored, but uh, there doesn't seem to be uh, any knowledge that he's done this work that started everybody off. I can honestly say that I was really inspired by some work that Tom was doing. He calls it the Three Tom paper, but this was with um, Tom Horton and Tom Parker. And they were talking about the idea that uh, encroachment of forests into, uh, at that point it was Manzanita scrubland, um, may be mediated by these below ground mycelial networks. And yeah. so my very first project working in Tom's lab was actually to try and see whether the same pattern held up between oak trees. and and uh, Douglas fir trees in some of the similar habitats. And sure enough, it was there. And I mean, it really inspired me to think both about those connections and thinking about kind of how landscapes change over time, thinking about disturbance and fire. I kind of ended up on the other side of the coin there for a while with thinking about host specificity. So as you all know, his genus Willis that he's done a lot of work on and also with Rise of Pogon, those are two 
great kind of classic examples of high host specificity. Um, and I, when I, so I, I finished up with Tom, and uh, at the time I wasn't sure where I was going to go. Uh, as a, I, I was interested in you know being in academics, but uh, I also was kind of excited about trying to be somewhere geographically near family, which was in Washington. And so, I applied to and got a position as a um, assistant professor of biology at Lewis and Clark College, which was a primarily undergraduate institution in Portland, Oregon. That turns out a lot of good biologists. It really does. I had a very close friend, Peter Gainesville, who was a graduate, and he had gone on and got a PhD in paleo yeah. at um, paleontology at Berkeley. Yeah, that's great to know. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Very good people that go on. Absolutely. Yeah. No, it was um, Tom and, you know, John's lab in Berkeley was a really fun and fertile place to be a scientist. Mm -hmm. And then I went up to to Lewis and Clark and I uh, started researching um, alder trees and I got fascinated by alder trees which have a actual yet another round of symbiosis on their roots. So they associate both with mycorrhizal fungi and also with Frankia bacteria which fix nitrogen. And so we did a bunch of work there and so there was a lot of curiosity. Why are these alder mycorrhizal communities so specific? And got some funding and that was really uh, a great kind of chance to learn and explore. Um, I didn't get to teach a mycology course. I'll tell you guys a funny story. I got hired in a plant microbe uh, position and so I taught botany as one of the courses and then I taught um, microbiology and I remember showing the chair at the time my first syllabus for my microbiology course and I, I had never taken a microbiology course either as an undergrad or as a graduate student and so I showed her the syllabus and about two-thirds of it was about fungi <laughs> and she said <clears throat> you know <laughs> that's great it's not how we do it you're going to take some pre <laughs> and about two lectures on fungi and you need to talk about viruses and you need to talk about bacteria yeah. and pathogens and so I quickly um, yeah, hustled to learn a lot about these other microbes. Well, I was noticing uh, that you were in a, a smaller undergraduate school. So did you have a big teaching load? I did, yeah. yeah. I taught um, five and a half courses per year. Yeah. <laughs> so it was a significant number. Yeah, I noticed because I was at Hope College for six years, and, and it was a great place. Uh, Lots of good teaching, but the problem was not enough time for research for me. Other yes. people, it's fine. Well, and our, our backgrounds are very <laughs> similar in that way because mm -hmm. I was at the oh, University yeah. of Puerto Rico for three years after I finished my PhD, but I, I had essentially no time for research. I was doing general biology lectures. I was doing mycology. I was doing the labs for the biology course. You know, it was many, many hours of contact <laughs> lab uh, work, but uh, it was, it, it's hard going. I, I think I, sometimes people forget what, uh, what it means to be yeah. in those spots. Yeah. Which I had to teach microbiology, but it was called bacteriology. Okay. So I, I was set on my uh, way to teaching nothing but bacteria. Interesting. <laughs> wow. Huh. You must have inspired New to. Uh, he's got a he's got a love of, of both fungi and bacteria. Yeah, New Wynn went to work with you as a postdoc. That's and right. went, yeah. yeah so you I had known him at Berkeley. So I had met New at Berkeley. Um, yep. And then I so I'd gotten. Uh, Actually, to, to the tenure stage at um, Lewis and Clark, I was lucky to get on a Fulbright Fellowship. I got to go down to Mexico and do some research with colleagues there. Um, I came back and, uh, yeah, you know, it wasn't, I didn't leave Lewis and Clark because I really didn't like that setting academically. Um, it was more of a, a personal decision. We decided as a family that, you know, the long term um, in Portland was, was going to be tough for, for us to be be happy, um, particularly my wife. Um, she didn't really like the rain as much as I did. I was born into it, so it was sort of a different thing. So we rolled the, the dice completely. There was a job um, and a hire, uh, a cluster a hire that was happening at the University of Minnesota, and this was back in 2013. And so threw my hat in the ring thinking, I'm, yeah, not gonna, I'm, I've, you know, happily settled myself somewhere else, and was lucky enough to to get an opportunity and, and an offer. And so um, so I decided to take it. Um, and so I knew when I got there that I really needed some good folks uh, to help us transition. So at that point, that was when the whole sort of uh, next generation sequencing revolution had come through. And so not only were you dealing with hundreds of sequences, now you were dealing with, you know, 
tens of thousands of sequences all at once. And so New had been doing some of that work in, in Berkeley, and, and I knew that that was a direction that would be fun to pursue uh, with him and, and others in starting my lab. I've always kind of been interested in broad community level questions. And so using these techniques to capture the diversity of really, really diverse fungal communities made a lot of sense. And so we spent a lot of time early on kind of thinking about this, trying to do our best to sort of come up with some some ideas. But I've, I think I've always encouraged my students, and I think Tom did this for me. I mean, I think while he's probably wildly best known for helping really get some of this molecular revolution started, I think he always was focused on the questions and not the methods. Mm -hmm. And I think he really inspired me to sort of keep that front and center. And so, you know, you've got to trust your data. And so you have to believe the methods you're working with. But at the same time, the questions are ultimately what we get out of bed in the morning to try and keep answering. And so I was lucky to work with new. We jumped into a new system. So characterizing the diversity of fungi in Minnesota, there was lots of great scientists that I stand on the shoulders of there. I actually got really lucky. And then I got there and everybody was excited about mycorrhizae already, which was fantastic because I got to work in these projects where, you know, there was decades worth of experimental manipulations of this factor, that factor. And they said, hey, would you like to think about the fungi in our system? constantly said, yes, this is great. Um, so I also got really lucky. And one of the things I really like about working at the University of Minnesota is that I've um, been privileged to have sort of a cluster of folks that are also, we all identify, you know, slightly differently, but there are lots of folks that study fungi. And so I can, in some ways, stay in my, my niche that is fungal ecology. And I, I don't necessarily have to be as you know, and, and, and you know, being in the society is great, learning about everybody's different perspectives, but I feel very lucky to have uh, colleagues just down the hall with. Yeah, now that's... you mentioned the cluster hire. Who was in the cluster? My, it was myself and Catherine Bushley. Um, and so we were a cluster there, but we were joining folks like Georgiana May, who um, you all know from MSA. Uh, Jonathan Schilling, is a, he did work, and Bob Blanchett, both on wood rot fungi. Uh, there was a number of folks. Corby Kessler was at the USDA Cyril Disease Lab. Um, you had folks over in the microbiology department working on cryptococcus, so Kirsten Nielsen, uh, Dana Davis. So there was kind of a wide range of folks that were. Is there a rust lab? <clears throat> You know, that was mostly through the serial disease okay. Um, okay. lab. So, mm -hmm. so that was USDA, yeah. but it was on campus. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Corby's group would interact a lot with mm -hmm. folks there. And there was other people in plant pathology. Um, Melania Figueroa, who did a lot of neat work on rust, she's now down in Australia, um, but she was hired around the same time. Scott Bates was also hired around the same time. So there was a cluster of, you know, new people that. that that's <clears throat> unusual mm. to be, be able to have that. Yeah. yeah. You know, I think the one thing, too, is that we're a small society and, you know, relatively speaking, yeah. our science is smaller. And so I think a lot of us may have gotten hired in to slightly different names of roles. Right. Um, but I think a lot of us kept our passion for fungi as we yeah. took on those roles. Yeah. When you think of mycology, we kind of cover everything about our groups and in botany. You've got plant uh, physiologists, plant taxonomists. Uh, and we have more fungi than they do. Yeah. Not quite there. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Um, so what's your teaching in Minnesota? Yeah, so I have teach a couple of different courses there. So kind of wearing these two hats, as I've told you about, uh, I teach in an introductory ecology course where I meet the freshmen, although actually the first day of their freshman uh, this is what I really like about the college that I'm in of biological sciences is at a field station. It's the Itasca Biological Station, yep. which is the headwaters of the Mississippi. Yep. And so these freshmen show up and I actually teach them a, uh, my, my module is it's called ecological checkerboards and I have them go out and we look at lichens on trees and then we quantify the lichen distributions and then do some math to look at whether those distributions are consistent with different types of species interactions. And so I do that right at the beginning. I see them in an ecology course and then I teach a course called um, Plant Algal Fungal Diversity. And so Dave McLaughlin developed that course and it covers all kinds of lots of organisms. I just teach the fungal portion of that, which is something that I feel lucky to um, have and, and focus on. Um, again, Dave has done you know, a ton of work to, to get a lot of that established. And then most recently, I've started teaching a field mycology course at Itasca in the spring semester. So we see lots of ascomycetes, yeah. um, which is exciting. Yeah. And um, so Jonathan Schilling is the a director but also um, at Itasca, but also a co-professor with me in the plant microbiology department. And, so we have an enrollment that's growing, and we teach that every spring. I, I taught one summer. I think I told you, you I taught one summer at Itasca. 
uh, when Elwyn Stewart was up there, he did a summer course at Itasca that was just fungus identification. Mm. Yeah. Yep. And so he was not doing it one year. He asked me if I wanted to do it. I went up and did it. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. So we, you know, I think one of the things that we've done, which I'm guessing you guys would imagine would make sense in any mycology course, is we've we walk people through the basics of when you collect in the macroscopic identification. We take them and start looking under the microscope. But we've also now involved a molecular component to that yeah, course, no, which I think is good. the way that we all do a lot of our science these days yeah. as mycologists. And so I think that's important to introduce to folks as kind of the pillars of ways of knowing fungi as there's the mm -hmm. macroscopic, microscopic, and molecular. Yeah. Okay, you mentioned Dave, that's David McLaughlin. That's David McLaughlin, yes, yeah. Professor Emeritus, yeah. worked in the Bell Museum uh, for a long time as the curator of fungi. Okay, and I, I saw you used to be a curator in the Bell. I, yes, I was the interim curator for a short period of time. Um, you know, I learned a lot. I didn't grow up in a herbarium, um, but I care a lot about fungi and like to spend time knowing who they are and putting names on them. I currently have a student, uh, Talia Michaud, who's doing this really fantastic project that is enabled by the collections of many folks. So we are looking at 150 years worth of records of basically plants that are and are not ectomycorrhizal and uh, ectomycorrhizal fungi and saprotrophic fungi and looking at carbon and nitrogen isotope signatures over that time period to think about how global change factors, things like increased carbon dioxide concentration, increased nitrogen deposition have changed and the responses of ecosystems and how these symbioses may buffer some of those ecosystems from some of those long-term changes and that's all collections based. So I feel very fortunate. Now we've got this far and you haven't me mentioned Necromath. <laughs> what in the world is Necromath? Yep. <laughs> nice. Well, thanks, Meredith. I'm, uh, I guess, honored that uh, you'd, you'd bring that up. Um, well, Don, had you speak yeah, about yeah, it. No, it's it's a topic it. near and dear to my current heart. So we've gotten really fascinated with the idea that when <laughs> fungi die, they basically become a really important part of the below ground carbon and nitrogen cycling that happens in lots of ecosystems. But mostly we've been doing work in forests. And so we think about all these mycelial networks and the biomass that's in this network. You were talking about the idea that, you know, we have more fungi than they do have plants. There is way more mycelium in soil than there are roots, right? And so we spend a lot of time thinking about how, when these fungi die, how do they get decomposed? Um, so at what rate do they decompose? How does their initial chemistry change those decomposition rates? And then we are are, of course, because we're mycologists, fascinated by which fungi are the decomposers. And so that's been fun. We can use our you know, community sequencing techniques to characterize who they are. We've added isotopes in most recently to see what's getting eaten. And so we're looking at who eats the carbon, who eats the nitrogen. It's a complete, we call it the necrobiome. It is a complete jungle down there in terms of all kinds of microbes, okay. lots of fungi and bacteria. So that's where we're at. We're doing lots of work on that. Are there other organisms? You know, that's a great question, and I love that um, we are just starting to uh, get at that. We, again, by using just a different set of primers. Um, and so we switched over, we started using uh, broad sort of 18S primers to capture the U the micro eukaryote community. And so we do get some fungi, but we're seeing all kinds of interesting nematodes. In fact, there are some interesting worms that seem to really like this habitat. I think they're big grazers in that system. Yeah. Um, I am sure, I am positive they're insects. Uh, we have yet to scale up completely, but worms we see a lot of. We see these little white worms that show up in the bags where we're rotting our little. So I, I like to think of necromass kind of like the Serengeti, like the necromass is the watering hole and there's all these other organisms that are sort of in the mix these days. And, and multiple <coughs> levels of interactions for sure. Correct, very much so. A couple of interesting things have jumped out recently. We've found that there's this kind of fascinating, we call it the congeneric colonization advantage. Um, so we did this research in a spruce bog up in northern Minnesota and what we saw was that we were decomposing um, the fungi that were uh, ericoid mycorrhizal fungi. So you get ericaceous shrubs in those habitats a lot. And when you went into those bags and you sequenced who was there, there was a huge amount of colonization by congenitors. Not the same, in this case, ericoid mycorrhizal fungi we're decomposing, but other, in this case, Melaniomyces and oidodendron taxa, really seem to prefer the 
the same tax relative to other types of necromass that we had put out. And so we're curious why that is. Are they better at decomposing themselves because they have the right sort of enzyme repertoire to recycle themselves? Do they sense themselves better than they sense other types of fungi, et cetera? So there's a lot of fun questions. Uh, the other thing that I really like about that system is, well, I think ectomycrosal fungi will always be near and dear to my heart. Doing experiments with them is challenging because they grow very slowly and getting sure. them into culture. And, you know, like I've said, I, as, any, as a person who asks ecological questions, who's interested in fungi as my study organism, having the chance to do experiments is really where I can <coughs> merge the sort of pattern and process. Okay? So uh, the necrobiome is full of culturable fungi. So yeah, so we've got a culture collection of lots of fungi and lots of bacteria. So you have all these nematodes. Do you turn up nematode trappers in you your know, cultures? We, it's interesting. We do not in the first pass, I am not seeing as many oh. nematode trappers as I might have thought. Um, yes. Have not looked as hard as I, I probably so I, I'm surprised because so often you can take almost anything that's decaying a bit and yes. has nematodes and you yes. ultimately get the fungi. Yeah. I think there's probably, you know, some we've just worked in one forest uh, recently. Yeah. And so I think as we look in other places, I hope that shows up. I'll keep an eye on it and I'll get in touch yeah. when I do. Bob yeah. Gilbertson and I got lots of nematode trappers and decaying, uh, decaying cactus yeah. when we were looking for slime moles. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Lots of them. Yeah. You know, you uh, dung and Yep. You know, rich soil yeah. and oh, yeah. so forth. You uh, yeah. end up with. You have to watch after. You know, it, it's our our part of it was always observational. You know, you get, get the substrate, you see what comes up yeah. on it. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, we've done a little bit of that work. Um, most of the time, we take out mycelium that we've we've grown in the lab, and we'll kill it and sterilize it, make sure it doesn't come back to life, and then we'll put it in these baggies that we can recover, so that we can characterize those communities and we've done some culturing off of it but usually it's get a culture quickly isolate to try and characterize it. so i want to go way way back okay you were talking about your father yeah. and did your family all were they all interested in mushrooms and where did they get this that's, uh, yeah that's a great question my father was not an academic or anything he was a carpenter um on the island where i grew up um i think at the time he just loved spending time in the woods and he enjoyed um, foraging for fungi. You know, it was pretty easy uh, to get out and look for chanterelles, and he was a big fan. How did he learn? He spent a little bit of time going to the Puget Sound Mycological Society. Oh, okay. At the time, there was um, the, um, gosh, uh, I'm trying to think of the book that Daniel St um, Stunts wrote uh, uh -huh. that was in black and white. I remember my dad's copy was in black and white and got updated. Wow. Um, but uh, yeah, so he knew enough uh, to, <laughs> to poison you <laughs> once, <laughs> only once. <laughs> only once. Um, and yeah, you know, I think there's definitely some circularity. I did not think when I was a kid I'd end up getting to do this yeah. uh, professionally, but I think spending time in the woods looking for fungi. Did he? Has he got to know that you were doing this? Absolutely, yeah. No, he uh, he's passed away since, but he and I got to do some foraging uh, quite a bit together. Uh, okay. It was really fun. He always kept me abreast as to when things were fruiting, and he had his all his spots that uh, he would go and check around, and we would go to together. So I got lucky. That was one of the big advantages of yeah. when I got quite up to fun. Oregon. It was quite really fun. a nice way to connect, and uh, yeah, it definitely was um, a great and uh, really kind of wonderful way to share knowledge and to know the fungi, um, both for time and bonding with my family, but then also to, to study them professionally. And a perfect place. It was a lovely, yeah, and you know, to be honest, I think almost anywhere is a perfect place to study mycology. They're just so diverse and so interesting. Yeah. I feel truly lucky to have gotten to work in Mexico, gotten to work in Colombia, I've gotten to work in, gosh, you know, Minnesota, and collaborators in various places. It's one of the fun things about yeah. our science is that we, we kind of get to go all over. And, yeah. Yeah, people always amaze that I know someone in Thailand, you know, for instance, or other places. Yeah. Yeah. The web that connects us, right? Yeah. Um, exactly. yeah. Yeah. Anything Good. else? Gosh, um, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. I, um, yeah, I really am just uh, really fortunate to feel like I am a small part of a very large group of uh, people who are interested um, in using fungi as a platform to better understand the natural world. Uh, another thing that I really appreciate about the society is how inclusive and welcoming 
It is. I think we've brought folks in who may or may not think about themselves as mycologists. And I think I sort of fell into that camp for a long yeah. time. But as I've spent more time here, I've always felt welcomed. And uh, I think that's that's true of our society. So I'm grateful. For I think in the past we were much broader. And then uh, it all, I think electron microscopy and not having a large page journal mm -hmm. kind of drew some people away. But mm -hmm. uh, I, I think we now have large pages. We have yeah. them online. You can enlarge them. So it doesn't matter so much, but I think some of these people are coming back. And, yes. Yep, I've noticed several at the meeting here. I think it's actually, you know, with the the technology is agnostic to organism, right? You get a different set of primers, and this is where I think we're so relevant. I think our biological knowledge of these organisms is what makes the difference when you get this you know, millions of sequences and trying to make sense of what they mean evolutionarily, ecologically, et cetera. It's, it's about the biology of the organism. And a lot of that's developed over many, many years and now we can figure out what, what they are. <laughs> yeah, and what they're, where, where they are, what they are, what we they're doing. We just didn't have the markers before. No, sure, sure, no. Sure, sure. At a certain level, but not yeah. down into the depths. Yeah. 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 So well, this is great, Peter. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, well, both of you. I really appreciate this opportunity. Yeah, Very great. good. So you're the first one we've come across that has a family background of any kind of measure in life. <laughs> My dad would be very honored to, yeah, to know that. So great. thank you. Yeah. Good. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.